Early on, someone asked me, who is the diocese? It was a good question, and the more I've thought about it, like a good Episcopalian, I think the answer is, it depends. Sometimes it may be the bishop, sometimes it may be the staff who works with the bishop at the Duval Center. Today, however, I think is the closest answer to the truth. Look around. This is the diocese. We are the Episcopal Church in the part of God's kingdom called South Alabama and Northwest Florida. We are the Old South. We are the Wiregrass. We are the Forgotten Coast. We are timber growers, peanut farmers, and fishermen. We are military and retired military. We are Alabamians, Floridians, and a smattering of snowbirds, too. We are yellow dog Democrats and Tea Party Republicans. We can be divided on issues, and yet we choose to abide in a church that believes that the most powerful symbol of the power of God in a broken world is staying together even in spite of our differences. Such devotion to unity is our way of living out Paul's vision of the body of Christ. And I am glad to be with you in this room of God's mansion called the Episcopal Church. I'm scared half to death. I'm scared because, what we, we, because we have such a wonderful opportunity in this new venture, and I'm afraid I might blow it. Those were the very first words of our very first bishop at the very first diocesan convention of the Central Gulf Coast. And I figure if George Murray can begin his first address with such candor, I'm in good company. I am scared. I am scared because this is important. You are important. We are important. We are so important, in fact, that God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it. And yet we took the best that God could give us and we killed him. And then on Easter, God raised Jesus and sent him back to us with a word of judgment. And that judgment is this, peace, peace be with you. With every reason to choose something else, with every reason to choose condemnation, God chose peace. And it is in that peace that stills the storm of fear. It is in that peace that is the first word of God's creation. It is in that peace that passes all understanding that I greet you for the first time as your fourth bishop. I do have one request. As you listen to what I say today and as you seek to tease out the meaning in my comments, please keep in mind I've been a bishop now for just a few months. There is still much that is new to me. I've already made mistakes, and I'm certain that I, they will not be my last mistakes. I have done a few things that have been interpreted to mean something that I did not intend them to be. I expect you may do the same with me, that you will do things that I misunderstand. Perhaps if we can both keep in mind this, then we are all new to this, then we'll figure out how to live together. I'm still getting used to the title of bishop, especially when it comes to meetings. And the, con the convention is the queen of all meetings. I love convention. I love seeing other Episcopalians. I love to hear about the good work being done. I love, love a good party. But I will confess that in my past, sometimes I would use the time of the bishop's address to write a sermon or to check my email. Now, in God's sense of humor, I am giving a bishop's address. I officially apologize to all my bishops. I don't know what you were doing one year ago, but I know what I was doing. I was freaking out. I don't know if Moses or Mary ever freaked out. And I know it's not a very biblical or scholarly word, but it's how I felt. I remember Robin, Hannah, and I gathered around my laptop in our home to watch the proceedings of the election, and I have two memories of that morning that will guide a few remarks. My first memory is that the live stream began long before the election began, which also meant that all the preparations were live streamed too. Members of the transition committee flashed by the screen Rushing around, tending to details. The camera was positioned and repositioned. The sound was adjusted. 
There were whispers about the process, this really weird beep that never stopped, and an occasional laugh that broke the tension. I don't know if anyone realized that everything was being broadcast into the world. But for me, I'm glad that it happened because it was a tiny glimpse into the vast amount of work, much of it hidden, that our transition committee accomplished on behalf of our diocese. Their work began so many months before that day and continued for many months afterwards. Thank you to Carolyn Jeffers and to the entire transition committee. And a word of acknowledgement for the Reverend Mark Wilson, who was a member of that committee, a good friend, but watch the proceedings from that great cloud of witnesses in heaven. When the decision was made to move the ordination to the Civic Center, it was made with some anxiety. Quite frankly, it was a step of faith. We did not have the money, but the money did come. That was my first sign of your hope and enthusiasm. We planned to seat about 1,000 people. Over 1,600 of you showed up and thousands more watched via the internet, another sign of hope and enthusiasm. Thank you to everyone who participated, from banner carriers to water bearers to choristers to acolytes to those of you who just showed up. It was a glorious celebration of our church. I also want to thank one person in particular, Judy Gulledge. She was tapped to turn a concrete box known mostly for Mardi Gras parties and turn it into a holy place for the worship of God. She did it magnificently, and she did it with a kind of grace that is beautiful. I don't know if you're here, but thank you, Judy. I also want to thank the search committee one more time. I can tell you they represented you well. I would not be standing here today, in part if it was not for their joy, their candor, and their hope that they exhibited to all of us candidates throughout the search process. Only they know the full extent of their work. Thank you for the late night reading, for the tough decisions, the countless meetings, your trust in each other, and your infectious joy. Thank you. The second memory I have of the election was watching the procession to vote. It was a bit surreal for me some of the people that passed by the screen I knew. A few I've known all my life. Others were strangers. Some of you were very pensive, serious. Some of you appeared to be praying as you walked. Some of you were grinning ear to ear. Amidst it all, hope was very much alive, and even before the vote was tallied, I was overcome by deep gladness to be the part of a church that chooses our leaders with such deliberation and care. Thank you. I have been humbled by your gracious welcome to me and to my family. Your care and your concern about our children has deeply moved Robin and me. Just as an aside, please know that Robin is as much of a minister as I am. She's a teacher which means sometimes she can't get with me to the places that I go. But I promise you these last nine months, she probably has worked harder than I have. Now, one year later, here we are. I have navigated just over 200 days as your bishop. I'm still learning a lot, and most days it's a lot of fun. In many ways, I still don't know what I don't know. Not a day goes by that I don't learn something new. I am learning that being a bishop is a good reason for a feast. I've enjoyed kettle, corn, in enterprise, shrimp gumbo in Andalusia, fried chicken in Bon Secour, collards in Mobile, caviar in Panama City Beach, yes, caviar in Panama City Beach, and raw oysters in Coden. It's good to be the bishop, except for when he steps on the scales. I am learning that the distances that separate us can result in a feeling of isolation and insignificance. I am learning that racism is an issue that has not been discussed much in our diocese. As a people call to reconciliation and restoration, it's time for us to do so and to learn how to discuss such issues with honesty and hope. I am learning that purple attracts a lot of attention. 
Some days being a bishop is like bullfighting. Some days it's like a game of connect the dots, only someone has erased the numbers. I am learning that you all have done a lot of studies about mission and vision. Let us give thanks for the folks who've done so. Thank you to those who dared to dream of a diocese, for those who oversaw the five-year plan, for those who authored the Blue Ribbon Report. Thank you for your love for our church that inspired all your work. Let us now set our faces to the future. It's time to get busy. With 19,000 miles on my car, I've learned the back roads of our diocese. I have visited 60 of our 63 churches. A few weeks ago, I realized how close I was to visiting every church. Being a bit competitive, I was sad when I realized it was too late for me to visit the remaining three before our convention. To those three churches, I am sorry. Visiting so many places means I get to hear about the amazing work that God is doing in our midst. So as a part of my address that I want you to catch a glimpse of all of that, I want you to help me celebrate. After all, the title the priest carries in worship is celebrant. So let's celebrate. When I, it's after lunch, so you're going to help me out here. When I call out a ministry with which you or your church is associated, I want you, as you're able, to stand up, wave your hands, or let out an amen, and I even absolve you if you break your Lenten promise and let out an alleluia. So here you go. Stand up if your church has a food pantry in your building or your community. All right, thank you. Y'all sit down. This is going to go fast, y'all. If your church has ever served a meal to the hungry, stand up. Look around. If you helped serve 2,600 turkey dinners on Thanksgiving at your church this year, stand up. Stand up if you or your church has somehow supported the work of Camp Happy Sands. Wow, all right. Stand up if your church opens it door, its doors to a recovery group like AA. Wow. Thank you. Stand up if your church actually had a recovery Eucharist for those in that community. Yes. Stand up if your church has a thrift store. Stand up if you ever gave socks, money, or any kind of help to Wilmer, Wilmer Hall. Wow. I hope Sally's here. Stand up if you've ever been involved in any form of prison ministry. Stand up if your church has a school or preschool associated with it. Y'all look around. This is a powerful form of evangelism. Thank you. Stand up if you've been to Crescia. Give out an alleluia. All right, good. Stand up if you've ever been on a mission trip outside of the United States. Okay, stand up if your church gives away medical equipment to those who cannot afford it. Stand up if you've ever helped with youth ministry. Good. Stand up if your church hosts musical concerts in any way for the community. Wow. Okay, stand up. Stand up if your church gives out hot dogs to the neighborhood every Monday at lunch. Stand up if your church sponsors a 5K run that raises $10,000. Stand up if your church sponsors any kind of community event involving food and music that includes fish fries, Cajun feasts, and barbecues and blues. There you go. Stand up if you ever raised the roof or built a habitat, ha habitat house. Good. Thank you all. I want to mention one last ministry that touched my heart. 
It's the work of one of our smallest churches, St. Peter's Jackson. During my visit, they asked me to bless a ministry, a new ministry, it's a lending library, which is a small house-shaped box on a post positioned at the edge of their parking lot. It was explained to me this way. We are next door to the hospital and share our parking during the week. So one of our members had the idea to share books. No matter who it is, going to the hospital can involve a lot of waiting. Having a book can help. I also want to celebrate the creativity of Church of the Redeemer in Mobile. They were looking for a new rector, but they knew it was going to be a significant financial stretch. After a lot of conversation, prayer, and a few experiments they involved, that involved changing their worship time and borrowing local clergy, they now have agreed to a very creative and collaborative ministry with St. Paul's Lutheran Church. They are sharing in an ELCA priest, Joy Blaylock, whom you already have met, and they're even listening for ways that their two congregations can do ministry together. And it's a wonderful, wonderful creative thing. My point in all of this celebration is to say that you are an amazing group of people and the churches in this diocese are doing a whole lot of amazing ministry and you need to know that. These are ways that we are being the church, not just doing church. Being the church is different. Being the church is a sign that God's kingdom is breaking forth among us. It is living the abundant life that Jesus offers in a way that others take notice. Such signs are noticeable. But there are other signs that not, are not so noticeable that deserve to be celebrated too. I ask each person that I confirm or receive to write me a letter. I ask them a few questions about the reasons for their decision. When I began this, I had no idea that these notes would mean so much to me. Listen to a few of the comments that I've heard. And this is just kind of a summary. I've had letters from folks who are 80 years old and 11 years old. I've read stories from former ba Catholics, Baptists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and even an Assembly of God. One man showed up because he was invited to the church at a community pool. One woman was playing the flute in the yard near her church and someone invited her to play inside the church. She never left. There are many people who found a safe haven in our church after perceived abuse in other churches. One man was even kicked out of his last church. Another woman who had been told she was going to hell. One woman summed up her feelings in one sentence. I felt like an outcast in my town until I found the Episcopal Church. Some married into the church, some were born into the church. One woman came because as she put it, I heard Michael Curry preach and I wanted to know more. And then the teenagers, teenagers who's one whose great-grandmother belonged there. In one of my favorite late letters, a teen who wrote, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> one teen said, I came here for my grandfather's funeral and I never left. Another wrote, ever since I heard music at church, I wanted to sing. So I wanted to go to church. Now I am singing too. And there was a young girl who wrote, my parents take their baptismal promises seriously, so I want to be like them. One man confessed someone gave him a ticket to a bayou bash. He showed up for the party and did not realize that Christians could have such fun. <laughs> and there were many stories of deep pain, divorce, suicide, coming out as gay, loss of jobs, and yet finding in our church a place of grace and healing. It's amazing how many people wrote that they showed up simply because of an invitation. We need to take that to heart. Very few walked in on their own. And finally, maybe my favorite of all was the girl from Pensacola who wrote, for me, confirmation is like loudly shouting to the world that I am a child of God. So what do we do now? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about if I ever finish this address. However, before we do that, I want to share a few principles or values for our work together as the church. First of all, let's dare to be curious. Not long ago, I had lunch with a rabbi from a synagogue, an Orthodox synagogue, and he asked me, so how do Episcopalians fit in with other Christians? 
After thinking about it, I said, you know, some Christians don't know what to do with us. We Episcopalians are curious by nature, so we can be a messy church, so we even disagree. We like to ask questions, and sometimes we'll just sit in the mystery. He smiled and quipped, oh, you're Jewish. <laughs> Maybe we are. No, we're not Jewish, but I think the world needs to know, just as Steve said at lunch, that some Christians don't have an answer for every question, and we're not afraid of mystery and an occasional doubt. As we go about our work, let's dare to be curious. Philip, when he joined the eunuch. Moses, when he turned aside to the burning bush. Somewhere in that, they were simply curious. And look what the Holy Spirit did. Being curious means getting closer to the problems in our communities and asking questions about the reasons. It means trying ideas and devising models that are unlike how we've done things in the past. Being curious means not shying away from conflict about issues, but joining together in trust to listen to each other. Secondly, let's be courageous. This goes hand in hand with curiosity. Curiosity takes courage, especially when it comes to the matters of God. We are the people of the resurrection, and yet we seem too often to still be locked up in that upper room of fear. Undoubtedly, our work ahead will require sacrifices of us. When Peter uttered the words, I now understand that God shows no partiality, that was a moment of sacrifice. He had to let go of some of what he'd been taught all his life. Our work will require some letting go too. Finally, let us be hopeful. Brian Stevenson, the author of Just Mercy, made this point in a presentation he made at my former church in Birmingham. Christians are very good at being faithful, but what we sometimes lack is being hopeful. He went on to speak very eloquently about how, as Christians, our hope in God's future should empower us to go forth and transform our world. Because Christ Jesus lives, we live too. Hope is that sense that something profound is happening even if we cannot sense it. We know that there is more going on than meets the eye. We know that all creation is groaning, not in death, but in birth. That is our melody. That is our song that we are called to sing forth in our lives. Hope is the single most important thing that we know. In spite of everything to the contrary, we are people of hope. Curiosity, courage, and hope. So let us begin our journey forward. I don't know a lot about being a bishop, but I do know this. I love Jesus, and I'm proud to be an Episcopalian, and I want the same two things for you. Thank you for calling me to serve with you in this work. Thank you for your trust that comes with being your bishop. Thank you for your faith and courage to live lives that witness to the power of God in this world. I hope, I pray, and I trust that the excitement and joy that is palpable in our diocese these first few months will carry on for a very long time.